Yo, welcome to another episode of the best BJJ podcast in the history of the world, the BJJ Goons Podcast. I'm one half of the team, Tim, the Mushmaster Spriggs, and with me as always every week is... What's up, everybody? It is No No Nico, and just like every week, I'm here with no new problems. I keep it consistent, the same thing, internet connections, running late, all the same things. That's No No Nico, the importance of branding, y'all. Y'all don't understand. Yeah, the importance of branding. Um, I've, I've got problems, too, um, but I'm figuring them out. But at the end of the day, life is good. Um, I got my health. At least I think I have my health. <laughs> so I think that's all that really matters, you know. But uh, besides that, um, it's been a couple of weeks since we've linked up. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. I know you guys enjoyed the Talis Pontus episode. And it's kind of serendipitous that, you know, he, he gets on the podcast and then he wins worlds and he finishes the year as the number one ranked brown belt on the planet, which is incredible. So shout out to him. Congratulations. I think his story is very inspiring just for the fact that he made something out of nothing and he did the damn thing. So congrats to him. We look forward to bringing him back on later on when he wins a black belt world title. And besides that, man, oh, just yeah. to, you're going to make him go all the way for the world title. You said when he wins the black belt world title, he just got his black belt. Well, if you haven't heard the episodes, he got his black belt on the podium at Worlds after becoming world champion. And when we were promoting the episode, he had mentioned how he's made it to number one in the rankings at every belt level. And he said he just made it at brown belt. And he's like, I slid in just in time. And I think he said this before he actually got his black belt. So it's no surprise that he won Worlds and got his black belt because he has been up there in the rankings the whole time through the colored belts. I think the power of self-belief is very understated in this story and in a lot of people's careers. It's the power of self-belief and that burning desire. I was on the, the phone. Self-belief, so, so important. Sorry to interrupt you, so important. I, I mean, I, I use it to this day. I use uh, positive visualization. And one last anecdote about this before I carry on in relation to Talis and his success. I was on the phone with a former guest. I'm not going to name who uh, yesterday, but we were texting and talking. And um, he was talking about how he understands why coaches leave coaching fighters, professional fighters or people that say they want to be professional because motherfuckers are lazy. Oh, that's so they true. Don't and you know, it. we're getting into that on our Patreon. You don't know, better not talk about this on this outline, but we're going to be talking about them coaches. That's a great thing. I never thought about like quitting because of lazy fighters, just throwing in the towel. I can't deal enough of you. Yeah. And I said that not everybody has that burning desire to be successful. It doesn't have to be fighting, but with anything. And it's understandable because in fighting specifically, it's very mentally, emotionally, physically taxing. The issue arises when you're trying to work with somebody and they lie about their intentions. They say they want to do it, but they don't want to do it. So and this is not the Patreon episode. Sorry. Stop telling my sorry. Tea. Well, this is a good preview Stop for the Patreon. That's this is not a good even preview. the outline. I don't know how you know that happened to me. <laughs> Regardless. But that's so funny. It's it's hitting close to home. I don't want these powers. Like, I really think I have like some kind of weird psychic powers when it comes to certain things. And it's very spooky and I don't like it, but it's pretty cool. Oh. Nonetheless, I think that an example of someone that has that burning design is Talis. And if you haven't watched it yet, please do. Because this guy is the future of the sport. And today's subject relates to the future of the sport. And it's a question that I asked when I first entered into jujitsu and when I was interested in being a mixed martial arts fighter back in 2006. And the question and the theme of today's episode is can BJJ become a spectator sport? Can it become mainstream? And I have some questions about it. I asked these questions when I was talking to Nico about what we we're going to talk about today. And Hopefully, by the end of this episode, we can come to come some kind of consensus. But this is all predictions, because at the end of the day, we don't know what's going to happen in this sport. For all we know, it might not exist in 10 years. So, Nico, just your initial thoughts when I posed this question to you yesterday. Can BJJ become a spectator sport? 
You want the answer, my answer? I mean, we can go into it or we can go through the questions that I asked. It's up to you. Like your initial visceral reaction to the question. Um, I think it will be hard to become a spectator sport. It, yeah, I'm not going to lie. If, if we just want to give my own personal opinion, like I was just at Worlds, I was just doing media coverage and the amount of fights that I could have seen sat down black belt finals and watched them mat side and didn't because I just didn't care was a lot most of them I only really cared to watch people who I'm personally invested in in, in mm. and like when I tell you like mat side at worlds is a really fun place to watch but I was still like yeah incredible and these are black belt worlds finals the the peak of the sport traditionally i mean like yeah the you know, key worlds through, some of them were interested in me it's like do i have to care and then, like when we say like when we say black belt worlds finals most people are talking about the black belt men's worlds finals like marigali and low like so there were some interesting things that happened in in the world that um I'm trying to look at the outline and be like, do I want to like say all of this? So it's like, there were some interesting things. For example, Shanja Hibero retired. That's an epic moment. But how many people actually know Shanja Ribeiro's history and what he's done for jujitsu? Mm, very few. Mm -hmm. So there's some people like, cause I know Tim, you study matches and you're more, you know, stuff like the up and comer, the new people, the blue belts that are in blue belts. Now, do you really understand and respect who Sean is? Like that was an epic moment. Um, seeing who else was it? The Kynan? Rafael well, Lovato retired as well. And in the history of American grappling, he deserves his own chapter. He put exactly. his belt on the mat. Um, you know, this year we didn't have a double gold world champion. I think that was interesting as well because typically over the last 20 plus years of worlds, we've usually had guys that get double gold and it's been dominated by either Hodger or Buchecha. Yeah. And, you know, you see these guys splitting it and we're starting to see the parity in the sport or just the, uh, the competitive level raise. And, you know, Go ahead, Nico. You were talking about but other then, highlights. So, <clears throat> so then, like, if we go, like, who was I interested in watching? Like, I always want to see May fight because I know May isn't going to win. He's going to massacre someone. Mm -hmm. he, he's going to make it savage, and it's fun to watch. And, like, he he delivered on exactly that. Like, he got, and then he ravaged his back, and then he choked him out. <laughs> like, it was really exciting to watch because you know there's a minute where he's going to turn up. But then you watch the final with like Gabby and Yara. They've gone around the world traveling and competing, but like their matches aren't as exciting. It's very close. It's very slow. It's very technical. Um, but if you know them very well, like you might see the differences in their game. You might understand how they've been working for each other and see the progress. But if you don't see the progress and the evolution in the matches between Gabby and Yara, then is it really exciting to keep watching it over and over again? Mm. So that's how I feel about watching the sport. Yeah. Well, I posed some questions to you and I posed them to myself because when I thought about the subject, I, I didn't want to just have a yes or no answer because when it comes to something like this, you have to figure out how it could possibly happen and whether and, and compare it to other sports and what appeal, what's appealing about them. So the first question I posed was, what about grappling is exciting? Because if you're going to get spectators, you need to be exciting. Um, and there's a pros and cons to it. So the thing that is exciting to me about grappling is that people can get hurt. Like people get choked out. People can get their limbs broken. You, get, you know, they could get thrown around, get concussions. Like that is exciting because danger is very exciting. However, on the other end... Concussion. On the other end of the spectrum, the matches are too damn long. I said it once. I said it twice. I'll say it a thousand times. These matches in the highest level at Black Belt do not need to be 10 minutes. They need to be six minutes at most. Nico, what do you think about the excitement factor of jiu-jitsu? Um, I agree with you about what you're saying. Some of the matches can be very long. Um, I think it's exciting when you have 
a good highlight reel moment where somebody's actually stunting off on somebody like I just said about May, but that hope happens the most when it, they're unevenly matched. It's hard to have that security when you're in the sport to hit those moments. So can it be really exciting? Never will I ever want to watch a double guard pool. Like, I don't care how aggressively you sit down, like, and then we kind of going into like trying to explain it to other people. It's like, there's so many variables variables in jujitsu that could get you like you're gonna double bar gar, double guard pull and then somebody pulls la, uh, lapel guard and then you're there for 10 minutes so is grappling exciting i would say it's not exciting to watch it's only exciting to watch it when you are a practitioner and there's a part about it that you enjoy mm. Well, let's go to that practitioner aspect, because the vast majority of people that watch jujitsu are practitioners of it. And I don't think any other sport is like that. I mean, like basketball, people have played it before, but in a level where they have deep understanding, absolutely not. Very few people that watch basketball even go to open runs. Most of the people that watch are out of shape, typical viewers. They're not exercising or doing something physical like that every day. And that appeal of basketball, as far as excitement is, they're going to score a shitload of points. These guys are the best athletes in the world. And on a base level, you're watching people run extremely fast, jump extremely high, and they're doing things that are circus level, like skills, like Steph Curry last night, he did, I mean, let's say not last night, game four of the NBA finals. He was just sinking shot after shot after shot from like a couple, like a dozen feet away, like deep threes, like damn near half court. And if you saw the shit in a circus, you'd be like, oh, wow, that clown is really good at doing that. But this is an athlete and it's easily translatable. Typically jujitsu is little guys and little geese scooting on their butt. And from a novice or someone that's never done it before, they're like, I could do that. That's not impressive. This shit is boring. So I understand completely what you're saying and the understanding of it. It's so complicated, which brings me to my next question that I posed. Is it easy to explain to more normies, <laughs> normal people? And I said, no, in my opinion, no, because one, there's too many rules way too many rules uh the, the typical competitor is going to have to read the whole rule book which is lengthy if you want to be a black belt you have to know the rule book but most of the people that are in the sport do not know the rules including the referees the scoring is complicated as hell uh advantages make no sense and once again the techniques and positions are super complicated I did a seminar this past weekend. Shout out to Ohio Braza. Shout out to Dion Thompson. What's good, Ankh, if you're listening? And for me, a guy that's been doing jujitsu for almost 20 years, trying to explain some shit to people that already do jujitsu and are doing do, have been doing jujitsu for a long time is difficult. I I just have to break it down as simple as possible. Like I was. Uh, my ears were smoking, like, you know, like the gears of my brain were turning, preparing for the seminar to try to explain some shit that it shouldn't be that difficult. What are you trying to explain? Just a reverse 50-50, like literally how to grab you under someone from reverse de la Hiva and lock in a reverse 50-50. Like a basic movement that you do in jiu-jitsu. You know, we do grambies. I don't know. Most, a lot of gyms Shut I know. Just and then. And finish it with Gramby. Huh? Are you freezing? Am I freezing? Did you hear, like, are you freezing? Am I freezing? You're hearing me clearly? I hear you clearly now. You broke up for a second. What were you saying? You cannot, you cannot say we were just doing a Gramby any time. It is never a kiss just of the a Gramby. A Gramby is not easy to do. A kiss Gramby of the not dragon. Easy. No. But mind you, but that hey, it's not easy ex- though. Grab me from a reverse 50 50. I can't, first of all, I can't picture no, 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 in no, no, my no. head. I, I, a in, in your mind's is. eye, in your mind's eye, I'm in reverse Stella Hiva. I do a kiss of the dragon and I lock someone in a reverse 50 50. 
the position, I don't the movement the to the next position. There's three steps. I don't There's think three I can parts. Picture, I can't picture Burhurst. Reverse De La Hiva. That's not an easy move. I'll give it to you, but like we're just nailing down like incorrect. Like Tim is correct. Yeah. Reverse De La Hiva. Okay, so I can see why that would be complicated to explain during the seminar. Okay. If somebody doesn't know how to gram be, you have to have prior knowledge for that. Yes. So I could see why it would be hard to go in in the seminar because like Jonathan Moicano, they do it at Today Kids Project all the time because they beer and bolo all the time in Brazil. But it's like nobody in America can do it. No grown people, no 30 plus people in America. You can't assume that they know how to beer and bolo. And that's kind of pathetic, but it also proves my point. But it proves my point. The techniques it and possessions are super complicated. And that's for me explaining. And I taught children for ages and I have a hard time. So imagine a normie watching this sport. They're like, they're just rolling around the ground, not doing shit. And what the fuck? And what are all these points mean? What is an advantage? He gets a point for almost yeah. doing something. Yeah, no. So that makes it totally non-spectator friendly. Thoughts? Would you like to add anything? I mean, it depends to what degree you're trying to explain jujitsu to a normie. And are you trying to teach them? Are you trying to bring them into the spectator realm? And if you're trying to bring them into the spectator realm, what are they watching? Are they watching Fight to Win? Are they watching Worlds? Are they watching who's number one, the reality show, where they're kind of trying to make it a little bit more spectator friendly open to the public maybe kind of explaining what jujitsu is by running it through that reality kind of series there's many different ways like for example never would i ever expect explaining the kiss of death to be easy kiss trying to explain why the close guard is effective whatever you want to drag in them you want to death them like i can't even say it <laughs> So it's like, if you're trying to explain like, you know, maybe like some principles from the clothes guard, that mm -hmm. might be a little bit easier. Like, am I ever going to be at Buffalo Wild Wings watching the UFC trying to explain how the clothes guard is effective for not getting raped well, by pulling somebody in between your legs? That's not a conversation I'm going to have. Like, it's not the time. It's not the place. Like, so it depends what aspect of jujitsu you're trying to explain. If you're trying to explain it to make it spectator friendly no i don't think it can happen like because there's too much there's too many degrees you can't explain like what stalling in a guard is you can't explain the pell guard like you shouldn't have to explain the pell guard if it's important if you want to bring in more spectators to like have more practitioners that understand okay so it's funny, it's actually great that you asked that because by what I mean by explaining is if I'm watching this on TV, if I'm watching hockey, it's very simple. Other team puts butt puck in the other team's goal. You cannot hit somebody with the stick. You cannot pass the red line that's offsides. It's very simple to explain. Even if you're just watching with somebody or by yourself, you can kind of get the gist of it. Jiu-Jitsu, not so much. And you said something very interesting. You said that, and what facet of Jiu-Jitsu are you trying to explain? Are you trying to explain fight to win, IBJJF, who's number one, who's next, all that shit, right? Well, here's the deal. It goes back to another one of the questions that I asked. Are the rules easy to understand? Because there are so many different rule sets. There are no unified rules in jujitsu to the point where we don't even know what jujitsu really is we don't we, what do we call jujitsu without the gi is it just no gi jujitsu is it submission grappling what do we call jujitsu in the is gi? It american jujitsu yes exactly that'd be like if i went to a basketball game and they had different rules like if i went to an nba game and the three-pointer was three points and then i go to a high school game or i go to another I flip the channel and there's another league and a three-pointer in NBA is different. And I go to another league and it's five points for a three-pointer. Do you understand mm -hmm. how complicated that could yeah. be? And then someone can say, hey. Studio 540, Studio 540 ran this thing where you could use the wall. The fuck? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, so instead of stopping, recentering, that you, you could go off the wall, kind of like MMA. And then like, 
Toro Jiu Jitsu, which is local to the East Coast, they have tournaments, normal tournaments, but they don't have mat spaces. So like you have one big mat and you're supposed to be in your space, but if you go out of it, your ref just follows you. They don't stop you. So like those things, they may seem very small details, but they're not small when you're trying to plan for a fight. That is the most weirdo, hippie, hipster bullshit I've ever heard in my life, man. You're telling me they just have no mat area? No, that's like saying, that's like if we had an NBA game and you're you allowed know, to shoot from the fucking like, tunnel. You could break that down to like hipster. Mm -mm. Huh? Yeah, like if you were allowed to like throw it to somebody on the bench and they could shoot from there maybe. Yeah, it, it's, it was weird. Like, it's kind of, it's like, it. I don't know. It was just weird. It was just, I guess, to avoid like resetting all of the time. But like, if you don't know why that matters, like, well, one, now you get points if you escape the mat in IBJJF. So again, we talk about, are the points the same? Are they not the same? But mm -hmm. two, you need to have a strategy on like, in MMA, especially like ring control is part of the points that you acquire. So like when you're mm -hmm. going into a jujitsu match at a high level or just an educated level, like you need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of like pushing your opponent out of the mat or you needing to get out of the mat like you sacrificing two points to not get choked out is a major thing like and if you take that away then you've taken part of a strategy away so it is very important those little details in the rules and the fact that they're not all the same mm. that's another strike against <laughs> the sport that we play <laughs> no unified rules but it's a huge it's a huge issue if you don't have unified rules, it's a wild, wild west. It's like how boxing was 100 plus years ago. Uh, you know, a lot of the most popular sports in this country, the big four, basketball, football, baseball, hockey. There's something about them. What is it, Nico? What do they all have in common? Male-dominated sports. That's all sports. Um, <laughs> unified rule sets? No. Well, yes. Uh, unified well, uniforms as well. All right. They're all team sports. Um, They're all team yeah. sports. Jiu-Jitsu has teams in a very loose kind of way. Because as we've seen, people jump teams and change teams like they're changing the drawers. You know, hopefully you change your drawers a lot. That's the joke. But can there be a viable team aspect to jujitsu every year at worlds they have a team title and it's broken down by male female juvenile masters but can there be a team scoring aspect that translates well for this individual sport because jujitsu is individual sport asking me first so for yeah. me i th think for scoring for scoring i don't think it's really relevant or should be relevant to me what you get from a team when you see somebody's team is their style of jujitsu like what mm. are you going to expect and i think maybe that might be a little bit more traditionally going back into it um because now with people switching schools so much like you know tli is known like if you see somebody that's tli in the bracket because you know they're going to be super hard. Like they're going to be uh, somebody that's trained to compete. They have that conditioning. You might not know their style because we don't have a particular one. Fernando Tete Day, if you know Fernando Tete Day's students, they got that hook sweep all day, every day. They got that hook sweep, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So to me, a gym used to be like the connotation of the kind of style that you would see from that athlete. Um, now, not so much because there we have teams like AOJ and Dream Art. They're just pulling big competitors, but they're also offering kind of services. So the team has its value. Um, and I saw somebody posting up more like about Dream Art. It was Meg he Just be like, so you can go. We reposted the post on our Instagram. She had it on hers. Am I talking about the route? Yeah, it was about yes. Dream Art, not just sponsorship. Yeah, last and week. It's like, teams need to be able to offer athletes thing like nutritionists dream art makes their students finish high school they made moicano finish high school although they did not give him money to follow the nutritionist plan where i knew they were paying athletes in america like they were giving them at least a thousand dollars a month to be sponsored athletes but then there was poor athletes in brazil that were asking me for money to buy food so like that didn't align with me but like 
there's still teams that are making the effort. Like Master Lloyd, does, like Master Lloyd has a fighter house. Master Lloyd supports different people in different ways, but like, what can a team do for you? Not just what you can do for your team, which is I think something that we might see coming up like with teams trying to get these competitors to get the rankings, but not give them anything. So it's interesting to see the role in a team in this sport or the lack there, the lack there of, of the role of the team in the sport. I don't know exactly what we're going to discuss later on with the Patreon, but I will say this, a light bulb went in on my, up in my brain. when you said that these teams want these athletes to boost their rankings, correct? But what does a team get out of having a team title and getting the rankings? What is the compensation for a team? That might be a factor too, but, uh, yeah, the team aspect is hard because a lot of the team aspect of jiu-jitsu that's so awesome is that we're they're like close-knit because we're not really getting paid a lot of money to do this. We just did it, and we just so happened to be lucky enough to find a gym in our area or join an affiliation, and then it's just like, it's like we're a gang. <laughs> it's like, it, it, it really is. I've never been in a gang, but I can imagine like it's us versus y'all fuck y'all we're going to try to beat y'all up and we want all the praise and we're just trying to show we're number one and that aspect it kind of it used to it used to translate at the worlds when it was packed it didn't look like worlds was packed was it packed nico um on the finals for the finals it was okay so saturday right. and sunday but it wasn't too bad no not like yeah. it used to be yeah so i think that needs to translate more and i think part of that has to deal with the marketing of it and also the personalities that would appeal to the public which is my next question are there personalities that are appealing to the mass public nico i'll let you answer that first what do you think i just kind of want to throw this mic get up and walk off the podcast because of that question why because these damn personalities that aren't actually good at jujitsu that are dominating the jujitsu media and taking up sponsorship from actual athletes and everything that we go through between trying to distinguish an athlete that has an amazing personality and is great at marketing and making reels, but can't teach anything because they have no real knowledge and people that are really good at the sport. Um, so it's hard. But I guess that's just me being old and having to accept change in this new generation. Um, and us old people just need to figure out how to show the difference between hype and real skill. Mm. Would you like to name any names? I know you have people in mind. I just was curious if you thought of any um, examples. Or maybe you shouldn't because you'd give them more undeserved attention. Well, let's just go to a friendly one that's no hate. Take, for example, Rico. I have no idea what Rico is doing right now. I don't, I feel like he quit jujitsu and he's trying to make beats. Okay. So it's like, and, it, and I'm not going to like what other people say because he's not in media, but it's like, so if you're an athlete and you're trying to make, and was like, I feel like Rico's at the point where he's trying like you trying to figure out what he wants to do in his life well let's just imagine like Rico was actually competing he had been at worlds there's a reason why he wasn't a legit one maybe yeah and he was gonna come down just to support the team when mm -hmm. we were talking about is the team viable like yeah he was gonna go down just to be mad side cheering and that matters for a competitor but it, where I was getting with Rico it's like He's doing a lot of amazing things, but I'm not sure, like, is he really good at jujitsu? Like, I want to know more about the flash challenge and analyzing that. And why does he do this? And like hearing from more people like Tim and maybe Jamil is like, are these challenges that he's doing? Are they really effective? Is it just hype? And like really bringing that in because those challenges, they, they, they went worldwide. Yeah. For sure. 
for sure. I, I've seen them from like I've seen them in Africa. Skilled, I know to be skilled because I've seen him show that like on social media, like the triangle, like people don't see the process that goes behind what he does. Because I've also filmed some of these flashy videos where he's doing and it's like Master Leda sat there and made him do it time and time and time again. And he was flipping into the video. Yeah. So I, was, I feel like. I was just... <laughs> uh, so <laughs> Rico is a person who has amazing talent in jujitsu he has that personality that makes him everywhere and i feel like maybe anything like he's maybe lacks in like maybe like definite branding like are you in music are you in this but like it's very easy for somebody to follow rico and do what rico does but not have that skill because they haven't spent hours drilling with jameel hill and other world champions like, yeah. you gotta you gotta take in account what happens afterwards and know that like Master Donnie and Master Lloyd have probably have many conversations about like, why are you doing beats when you need to be doing jujitsu? Like, like, so he's gone through that work of like, you know, am I an athlete? And I this, and a lot of people aren't doing that work. They're just trying to be like, oh, I'm gonna do flying arm bars and da -da 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 for Instagram. And then people are going to know me about this. And then they're going out in a competition and they're getting smashed. Or maybe they're going out in competition at the lower belts and they're doing great, but they're not really analyzing their game. They're not really analyzing their mistakes, their mistakes, and they're not evolving. So by the time they get to black belt, what do you have? Do you have a social media following or are you an expert in jujitsu? Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge aspect of what personalities are appealing. And I think if it, the sport were to be legitimized, guys like Rico would do great, but they'd have to have the competitive success really. Because then I look at other sports that, yeah, you could do flashy shit, but eventually you will get roasted if you don't win. And I think that's the issue with jujitsu right now is that, like you said, personality over performance, and that's not going to fly if it were to become mainstream. There's a couple of other things that I think, about the personalities in jujitsu that are appealing to the public. Right now, there's very few. Uh, the, and for better, for worse, Flow is the number one media outlet, which in other sports, there's several. There's like at least a half a dozen media outlets that are major. And they all give a different take on what goes on in the sport. The problem with Flow is who they cater and market to because their biggest star says racist, xenophobic, even just disgusting things like, you know, even said something sexual about a toddler. And uh, one of the biggest names in media of it is a guy that isn't very cool. And he gives me the vibe of, uh, you ever see that meme with uh, Steve Buscemi? It was like, hello, fellow young people, like that kind of vibe. And it just doesn't come off as cool. Um, I don't think that's very appealing. Uh, I don't think it's it appeals to some demographic to that demographic. But let's be honest, that demographic is Reddit and a certain demographic that I don't know, man, I, I'll compare jujitsu to pro wrestling, which pro wrestling has millions of people that watch every single week, right? You watch pro wrestling, it's diverse. There's people from different backgrounds. There are people with some swag to them. They have people that are worldly and it appeals to different types of people. And, and let's be honest, like pro wrestling, it is a melting pot and it shows in every single event. I'm on the indies and they have people that are gay. They have gay wrestlers and they're, they have non-binary wrestlers. They have unapologetically black wrestlers. They have hillbilly wrestlers. They have all types of wrestlers and everybody is being served at these shows and just served. Jiu-Jitsu, not so much. Actually the antithesis of that is not very welcoming to outside people. And if you look at the people that are stars in jujitsu, if if jujitsu was mainstream, these people would not be sponsored. They'd be either canceled, censored. It wouldn't happen. And I don't think there's any real personalities that are getting a push. You know, we need more guys like Rico that are fun, loving, and hip. We need more people like, who's another person? Like Xanadu. We need more people like Meg He that are kind of just, you know, 
they have a, the business side of it. You know, we need more jujitsu podcasts that are like talk about the finance of jujitsu. We need more people that are in the LGBTQ community that are able to open up and say, I am a gay jujitsu practitioner, but it's not just that I'm gay. It's that I'm very fucking good at jujitsu. It just so happens that I'm gay and I represent that. It should be a space where someone can say, I'm unapologetically black. I represent black people that feel disenfranchised. I'm not an uncle Tom. I do this. I do that for the community and they should be able to feel as though they have a voice. That was what would happen with personalities in a mainstream sport. And they would be able to breathe and have fun. And the sport would be more open to that. Jiu-Jitsu is not like that. So yeah, you're right. They appeal to a certain demographic, but that demographic graphic is not going to make you mainstream unless you want to be like on Fox news mm -hmm. you want to do fox news bjj of course you could do that but let's be real here that's not gonna get you a lot of sponsorships and a lot of new people coming in so yeah. i think you're frozen are you there and it's funny that you mentioned meg he yeah i'm here but it's okay. cutting up a little bit can you hear me yeah i can hear you so it was funny you mentioned meg it's funny you mentioned Meg He because I saw her and her partner Margaret, Mar Margaret, Margot. <laughs> She's Mar. It's, there's a T at the end of it. I thought I don't know, or maybe I'm just confusing it with different people. Oh, that's horrible. I think I the the T and Margot is silent, but you know, your heart's in the right place. <laughs> uh -huh. so I was like really big fans, really big fans of both of them, and then I was watching Margot is keep to uh coaching Meg and then the other day around when it was on Saturday I was watching Margot compete and I was like she's got a really good guard and then I really I was like I ain't never seen her jujitsu like I'm such a fangirl I tell them about both of them um all the time about the content they create because they create great content for the industry about like Meg with her financial stuff Margaret with just being like you going out move be active and then I was watching I was like her guard is phenomenal and then we were talking about, do we watch jujitsu? It's like, I have to be personally invested. And mm -hmm. it's like, I was personally invested into them because of what th they said. And then I was dying to meet them at Worlds. That was really cool. But then watching her compete and like realizing like she is an amazing guard. Like I need to go to watch some more of her fights now. And like, that's how I find people to watch. It'd be like, oh, you have a good guard. You're kind of like my size it might translate to my game like let me go study some more about you or do you have any tutorials or things like that that's awesome it that goes back to the personality yeah. thing if you don't know these personalities or these personalities are kind of silenced or these people don't feel comfortable putting themselves out there because of the vibe of the sport you're you would have never you're never going to find it you know and i think meg he said it great Athletes are expected to be athletes and should be expected to be athletes, but they're not publicists. They're not financiers. At the end of the day, we're going to need more media outlets to get these stories out there. I mean, Maggie is doing a great job of promoting what she does. Uh, Margot Cicciarelli, is that how you pronounce her last name? I believe she does a great job. I can't even pronounce her first name. <laughs> regardless um, yeah, the emotional investment is a huge part of sports. If you're not emotionally invested, no one's going to give a shit. That's why we have ESPN, Fox Sports, all these other outlets, and they have different takes and they have different awesome personalities on these shows that get you enticed and interested in these sports. Because there was a long time I didn't give a shit about basketball or even football. But by watching these shows or just having these sports personalities, it's going to bring people in to watch. Um, you know, so that's that's it with the personalities. Uh, the last thing I had, the last part of, you know, will jujitsu be mainstream is uh, the barrier to entry. And I think that might be the most damning thing when it comes to their argument of whether or not they will be mainstream, because there's three points I have. One, it's expensive. Two, accessibility. There are gyms in every state but in every town, in every city, not necessarily. And three, you need a special area to train. It's not like soccer where all you need is a ball in the open field and you can play. It's not like basketball where they got a hoop everywhere. You need a special area to train jujitsu unless you want to get scraped and battered and bruised by the elements. Nico, what are your thoughts on the barrier to entry for this sport? 
we can just leave it with that. We've gone over a lot of barriers to entry. We all know there are, but we're definitely over our time. So your okay. thoughts on that are enough. <laughs> We've probably been filming for like an hour now, a little less. Yeah. Uh, we're probably maybe on 45, but we all know there's barriers to entry. And the ones that you hit are really good. So it's like, that's not going to affect it being a spectator sport. But yes, there are definitely barriers to entry. Cool. All right, then. Well, I want to know what you guys think. So make sure you guys go to the comment section of this YouTube video, or you can message us on Instagram at BJJ Goons Podcast. Nico, where can we find you? I guess Nico can't hear me. So you guys can find me at Tim Springs. Make BJJ. sure to follow me on Instagram at no no Nico and slide on over to favelajujitsu.com. And you can find me at Tim Springs. Hello? Hello, yeah. And you can find me at Tim Spriggs BJJ on Instagram or Facebook. And make sure you go to timspriggsbjj.com to book a seminar, a private lesson. I can create your game plan for you. I can even critique your match footage. Just hit me up at timspriggsbjj.com. On behalf of Nico Ball, it's your boy, Tim the Mushmaster, saying thank you for watching the latest episode of the BJJ Goons podcast. Until next time, peace.